Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. We are waiting just a minute uh, for everybody to filter in, and then we will get started. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. And first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Hillary Hartfalk. I'm the president and CEO of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And while I have um, only had this role for a little over a year, my history with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation goes back to a field trip in sixth grade, uh, followed by an internship in 1997 and uh, a job just out of college. So like many of you, uh, the Chesapeake Bay is so incredibly important to me, um, and I'm thrilled to be here today to give you a behind-the-scenes look on the State of the Bay report. At CBF, there's an unrelenting commitment to save the Bay, and this webinar is designed to let you know uh, all about the State of the Bay report and all the things that we've learned uh, since we've been doing the report since 1998. Joining me today are CBF's Director of Science and Agriculture Policy, Beth McGee, and Senior Ecosystem Scientist, Chris Moore. I have a couple housekeeping announcements before we get started. The first is that the presentation today is being recorded and be, will be shared with guests when it is complete. And we're excited to answer individual questions. Please submit your questions first, uh, at the bottom tab that says Q&A at, um, at the bottom of your screen. Green. Questions will be addressed at the end of the program. And if you encounter any technical difficulties, please use the chat function, which is also located at the bottom of your screen. And with that, we'll get started. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation's goal, of course, is to save the Bay and keep it saved. Since 1998, we've been answering the question, how is the Bay doing um, with the State of the Bay report? The 2002, the, the 2022 State of the Bay report remains unchanged at 32, equivalent to a D plus, and shows still that too much pollution is entering our waterways. The bays, the bay, its and rivers and streams will not improve until we dramatically decrease pollution, especially from agricultural sources. Under the commitments of the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint. Achieving a bay is possible if we continue to work hard. Of the three of the 13 indicators assessed, three improved the scores for phosphorus, oysters, and rockfish. Um, with that, also three declined the scores for blue crabs, water clarity, and resource lands. I am happy to hand it over to Beth McGee, Beth McGee to share more. Great. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, yeah, as Hillary said, we've been doing the report. I'm Beth McGee, Director of Science and Agricultural Policy. I've been working on our State of the Bay report since about 2004, so geez, almost 20 years, but not as long as the report has been around. Hillary mentioned it was uh, started in 1998. Uh, what goes into the State of the Bay score are uh, 13 different indicators in three different categories, so pollution, habitat, and fisheries. 
And really the, the indicators are designed to sort of tell the story of how these various indicators relate to one another. How does too much nitrogen and phosphorus relate to oysters and blue crabs? So we're really trying to, to tell, the, tell the story of the bay in a way that's understandable for the general public. Uh, the best, our scores are ranked from zero to 100 for the overall score as well as the individual indicators uh, with 100 being really the theoretical bay watershed that existed um, prior to European colonization. So we know that a score of 100 is no longer possible. We've affected land use and other things um, to the extent that we will never have a pristine bay as we envisioned more than 400 years ago, but we believe a, a score of 70 is possible. So we're sort of grading on a curve as if you will. So wanted to talk a little bit about how these indicators fit together. Um, this is showing you a, a degraded aquatic system and a healthy aquatic system. And the, the main systemic problem affecting the Chesapeake Bay and many other coastal and nesting systems across the world, frankly, is too much nitrogen and phosphorus. These are nutrients. We add them to our, our, our yards to make our grass grow. Farmers use them to make their crops grow. But when they get in aquatic systems in excess amounts, uh, they do a couple things. One is they feed the single cell plants in the bay called algae. Uh, this in and of itself can be a problem when you have algae bloom. Some species of algae are actually toxic. So it could be toxic to humans, could be toxic to fish that live in the bay. So that's a problem. Uh, too much algae can also shade the water and, and underwater grasses are a really important ecological feature of the bay. And their, their underwater grasses are plants that need sunlight. So if they have too much algae, they're blocked and they can, uh, the, the underwater grasses can suffer as a result. Uh, but probably the main problem is that when the algae bloom and die and sink to the bottom, when they're decomposed, oxygen is used up. And so that's what results in the dead zones that we see every year in the Chesapeake Bay main stem as well as in the tidal rivers is this link between nitrogen and phosphorus and the dead zone in the bay. So that's the main problem we, you know, we're trying to fix is water clarity and dissolved oxygen. I did want to note um, one of the the boxes, I don't know if you can see them, but the boxes at the bottom, um, many people have wondered, will the bay recover in a, in a linear way? In other words, when we reduce pollution, do we expect that the bay is gonna gradually come back or it, will it be something else? And the answer is it will likely be something else. And that something else is, it hopefully will reach a tipping point. Um, there are feedback loops within the bay ecosystem that will drive the, this idea of that the response of the bay to reduce pollution will not be linear. And, and one of those is depicted in the graphic. Under low oxygen conditions at the bottom of the bay, nutrients are actually released. So we, they are then available to feed the algae again and create that, that dead zone. So we have sort of a negative feedback cycle that we're trying to break. If we are able to break that cycle, if we bring oxygen to the bottom of the water column, um, we will see those nutrients tend to stay in the sediments, not be available to feed algae again. And so, um, so that is how the bay, we hope, will respond in a more positive way to our pollution reduction efforts. So let's talk about the various categories. The first one is pollution. There are five indicators in this category, nitrogen, phosphorus, dissolved oxygen, water clarity, and, and toxics. Um, so I mentioned nitrogen and phosphorus, the main pollutants that we're trying to reduce um, through implementing the clean water blueprint. Uh, the scores for these indicators uh, did not uh, change for nitrogen. It, it improved slightly for phosphorus. Worth noting is that, um, uh, so this reflects the fact that the, the loads of these pollutants were not that much changed from, uh, from 2020, which is the last time we did the State of the Bay report. So not great news there. But the good news is, and this is showing you loads of nitrogen that are coming into the bay at the nine major river systems. So there's monitoring stations at the, at the tide, tidal reaches of those nine river systems. We measure pollution coming down and it's a good surrogate for overall loads coming into the bay. And the line on this graph indicates, so this is over time, pounds of nitrogen coming into the bay. The line indicates a historical average. And you can see in the last couple of years, we've been below average. So that reflects the fact that the years have been sort of dry, but also reflects the fact that we've been implementing the blueprint and we're seeing the benefits of those pollution reduction efforts. So that's, that's the good news. But as I mentioned, our scores remain relatively unchanged because of the loads in 2022 were not that different than 2020. 
the dissolved oxygen, I mentioned this is the, the main problem we're really trying to fix in the Bay because it affects so many of our living resources. And it, it, our score is based on estimates of the volume of the dead zone in the Bay, um, in, in this case for 2022 over the summertime. And as I mentioned, that what drives the volume of the dead zone really is the nitrogen and phosphorus that come into the Bay primarily during uh, the spring and early summer. So these are the data that we actually look at when we're estimating our, our uh, dissolved oxygen score for the Bay. This is showing you the volume of the dead zone for the main stem of the bay um, on for the average from May to October. I mentioned the summer is the main time when we see the real big dead zone. And you can see again, there are some the good news in that the, it, this line represents the average historical average for the dead zone. The fact that the volume was smaller in 2022, that's the, that's the good news, but it still means that we have a lot more pollution um, to reduce. As Hillary mentioned, um, the states are behind in implementing their cleanup plans for the bay. Um, so that's problematic. We need to reduce pollution. And perhaps worth noting is that if you look at the state plans and where we need to and implementing them to, to finish implementation, more than 90 percent of the remaining pollution reductions need to come from agriculture. So that's our uh, one of our big emphasis for the Bay Foundation is, is trying to get at agricultural pollution reductions. The last thing I'll note is that um, climate change is affecting many of our state of the Bay indicators. Uh, the dead zone is, is no different. Uh, dissolved warm water holds less oxygen than um, warm water holds less oxygen than colder water. Uh, we know that the bay's temperature has increased, and that in and of itself is making the challenge of restoring the bay even more difficult because all things being equal, um, we're having less oxygen in the water because the waters are simply getting warmer due to climate change. So water clarity decreased um, slightly. I mentioned the importance of water clarity um, in, for many reasons, but one main one is because of the underwater grasses in the bay that are so important ecologically. Underwater grasses are plants. They need, they need sunlight to hit them in order to grow. Uh, the fact that the water tends to be fairly murky is, is not a good thing. And what we had seen is that the water clarity in the bay uh, dropped from 2020 a little bit worse. But the good, again, I always like to put some good news is, is that despite this drop in score, if you look at the long-term trends in water clarity over the last 30 years, there has been an overall improvement in water clarity. So that's a, that's a positive sign that our pollution reduction efforts are working. Uh, the last pollution indicator is toxic. So this is reflecting you know, toxic contaminants that are in the Bay watershed system. The score remains unchanged. Part of that is because two of the pollutants that mercury and PCBs, which drive a lot of our fish consumption advisories in the Bay, are pollutants that don't tend to go away. In the case of mercury, it might change forms, but it's not going anywhere. PCBs are really slow to degrade. And so even though we've banned PCBs for decades, we still find them in our systems because they really aren't or take a long time to degrade. Uh, the other reason why we're not seeing a change in toxic score is that we're finding new and emerging, what they're calling new and emerging chemicals, things like microplastics, or PFAS, which are man-made chemicals that are found in, in fire fighting foams and, and nonstick cookware that recent studies indicate we're seeing them in fish, shellfish, and water. The impacts of finding these chemicals are, are remain unclear, but we're, the fact that we're seeing them is somewhat alarming. So let's move on to the habitat indicators. There are four of those, forested buffers, wetlands, underwater grasses, and resource lands. So forested buffers, um, no change in this score from 2020. Forested buffers are basically planting trees along streams. Uh, they're really important for water quality perspective. If you look at the state plans in terms of how they're going to achieve their pollution reductions over time, forested buffers is one of the most cost-effective practices that they're relying on. But unfortunately, implementation has languished in recent years. This graph is showing you a number of acres of forested buffers over time that we believed to exist in the Bay watershed. And you can see we were, you know, in 2010, we kind of uh, ramped up our efforts in a large part due to federal legislation that created a program called the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, which funded most of a lot of the buffer implementation from the mid 2000s on. But you can see we've seen a, a dramatic drop off in, in implementation as well as the fact that we're losing buffers so that in recent years we're well below where we need to be. If you, if you aggregated all the 
riparian buffer acres that are in the state plans. It comes out to over 130,000 acres we need to see on the ground, and we're only at 30,000 acres. So clearly, this is a really important practice, uh, but we need to improve implementation. And, and I mentioned the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program is one of the ways that we hopefully will get more buffers on the ground. Uh, the Farm Bill is the, the overarching federal legislation that can this program. It's up for reauthorization this year, and one of CBS's priorities is really to try to reinvigorate and make this program uh, robust again like it was in the mid-2000s when we really saw a lot of acres going into, into buffers. Okay, wetlands, um, they provide habitat, they filter pollutants. They're also really important for mitigating the effects of climate change because during storm surges, they can act like a sponge and basically uh, reduce that impact of storm surge. But again, it's a, it, there's no change in this indicator and it reflects the fact that we are really far behind in achieving our goals for wetlands. According to the most recent data, we've only achieved about 11% of the watershed wide goals for wetland restoration. Um, and the, that goal was 83,000 acres of wetlands created on farmland and we're only about 11% of the way there. At the same time, we know that climate change and sea level rise are affecting wetlands. A recent study indicated that, that within the next, um, that over time sea level rise could mean that we'll lose about 250,000 acres of wetlands and coastal habitats in the Bay region. Underwater grasses, I mentioned that um, these are really important ecological feature. They're, they're uh, habitat for the larval uh, crabs and fish that Chris will talk about, um, really important there. They can also uh, reduce nutrients in the water by either settling out sediment or sucking up nutrients. So they're just really important ecological feature. And unfortunately, um, they're not doing uh, well either. They dropped, our score has dropped, or didn't change between um, 2020 and 2022, but the score is pretty low. This is showing you acres of underwater grasses over time. The way we get this data is that there's an aerial survey that's done every year over the bay that maps the acres and estimates, tries to quantify that. And so that's a really important monitoring tool. Uh, you can see this showing you acres over the time. We actually were doing really well, 2017, 2018, we had the, a record number of underwater grasses. But you, if you've been in the Bay region, you also might recall in 2018 and 2019, we saw some super, a lot of severe storms, a lot of pollution, sediment, um, algae blooms coming into the Bay, and that resulted in a pretty substantial drop off in grasses between 2018 uh, and 2019. And the Bay, frankly, the, the grasses are starting to recover, but they really haven't come back um, fully yet from that knockback that they saw back in um, 2019 when water clarity just was really um, obliterated. Uh, the last category is resource lands. So this is uh, farmlands and forests and natural areas across the watershed. Uh, the score did decrease, Hillary mentioned this. Um, and it's because we're losing, we still continue to lose a lot of land um, to development. Uh, we had the benefit recently of having really fine scale land use information for a couple of time periods, which really allowed us to look very closely um, at this indicator. And the recent data suggests that between uh, 2013 and 2018, we lost roughly 95,000 of acres of farms and forest land uh, transition into development. So that's not a good trend and one that we hope really will improve with both local and, and state uh, policies and regulations. And with that, I will turn it over to Chris Moore, CBF Senior Regional Ecosystem Scientist to discuss the fisheries indicators. Uh, before, but before that, I wanted to remind everyone that if you do have any questions, uh, please continue to put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Thanks. Um, over to you, Chris. Thanks, Beth. I really appreciate it. And uh, first, before I really talk about fisheries, uh, thanks, Beth, for the lead in about the importance of a lot of these habitats for fisheries, underwater grasses being a prime example. Uh, the water quality aspects and those habitats are so important to the health of our fisheries as well. And anything that we do to reduce pollution is not only going to help those habitats, but also help us have more abundant and um, more robust and more abundant fisheries as well. Um, talking a little bit about fisheries, I, I think uh, I'm always privileged to be able to talk about fisheries when it comes to the State of the Bay report, because I think in a lot of ways, it's where people tend to have their fondest connection to Chesapeake Bay. Um, whether folks like to go out and catch rockfish, uh, you know, during the summertime, uh, eat blue crabs, uh, throughout the year or sit down to oysters in the fall and the winter time. 
um, people have some of their best memories and strongest connections to the bay um, through the fisheries aspects. Um, as Hillary mentioned, uh, the overall score hasn't changed, but there has been some variations throughout the score. And I think fisheries is one where sometimes we have the biggest jumps um, from, from report to report. Uh, obviously, these populations are not static, and some are moving up, as you can see, and some of them are moving down um, from year to year. And uh, this report is very science-based, and we try to use the best available science in order to make sure our report uh, basically aligns up with the data that scientists throughout the watershed are producing um, on these various species. So wanted to uh, start out with uh, rockfish, also referred to as striped bass, um, score of, of B minus, which uh, is not bad, uh, actually one of the best scores in the report, and uh, able to report some fortunate news. Things are moving in the right direction overall when it comes to striped bass. Uh, unfortunately, we're still not to the point where many people remember the historical highs of striped bass we saw back in the mid 90s through the mid 2000s. Um, part of the reasons we're going to see an increase in the score uh, in this report is through uh, coastwide management actions that were initiated by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission that have helped reduce the catches of striped bass uh, to more sustainable levels. So this is actually one of the, the slides that comes from uh, the, what we call the stock assessment update uh, for striped bass. And uh, this shows you how many fish are actually uh, being harvested in any given year. It also shows you uh, the amount of commercial landings as well. And here in the Chesapeake Bay region, about half of our harvest is from commercial landings and about half of our harvest uh, is from recreational landings. But on the coastwide level, um, only about 10% of the total harvest is from commercial landings. And that's one thing that sometimes people miss when we think about managing uh, this highly valuable resource uh, for both our commercial fisheries and our recreational fisheries. Um, as you can see, uh, partly because I think people have stopped fishing for striped bass as much because there's not as many, um, our harvest has gone down, but we uh, hopefully in doing that are going to start preparing the population for a, a, a rebound here in the next couple of years. Uh, when it does come to striped bass, one of the things that we need to remember is that uh, the spawning areas in Chesapeake Bay are so important to the overall health of this uh, population. Um, historically, approximately 70% of the coastwide population of striped bass was actually spawned or born in Chesapeake Bay. And one of my real worries thinking about this species is climate change continues to warm our waters. These areas that uh, striped bass spawn are not going to be as cool uh, in the spring or as wet in the spring as they used to be. And those type of conditions, cool, wet springs, are the ones that tend to coincide with um, healthy striped bass spawning years. And so um, not only do we need to make sure we manage the overall population uh, well, but things that we can do to make sure they have the best spawning habitat uh, possible are really important for striped bass as well. Uh, moving on to oysters. Um, this is obviously one of our most iconic species in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, there are species that we're uh, spending a great deal of resources to try to restore uh, throughout Chesapeake Bay. And despite this overall low score in the population, um, we are seeing really, really positive signs when it comes to our oyster restoration successes in Chesapeake Bay. This is both in Maryland and Virginia. Um, we have a 10 tributary restoration plan that's going on right now. Um, we've completed about seven of those at this point. Um, those projects are looking really, really good. We're also seeing some help from Mother Nature. Uh, both states are reporting some of the highest rates of reproduction um, that we've seen in our oyster population over the last 30 years. And so that, that's really, really good news. Um, again, bringing the, the climate change uh, aspect in, when we have more prevalent heavy rainfalls, that's one of the things that can unfortunately degrade our oyster population. So building a, a more robust and healthy oyster population to try to be able to make sure that they do survive and thrive um, under these uh, more, um, common heavy rain events is going to be equally helpful. Uh, the other thing that we need to think about is as this resource continues to increase, the fact that um, we can obviously harvest some more, but doing so in a very cautious and, and, and prudent manner. 
Um, obviously, we want to see the oyster benefits go to everyone from, from water aspects to their habitat aspects, but to also to the folks who harvest um, oysters as well. But on the other hand, we want to make sure we don't harvest so many now during this period of relative abundance um, that we that we kind of backtrack on our overall restoration efforts. So, you know, generally when it comes to oysters, I like to tell people that you know we're, we're moving in the right direction, but we still have a long way to go. Continuing to invest heavily in these tributary scale restoration efforts that have been so successful over the last couple of years is really one of the keys to making sure that we continue to restore this iconic population in Chesapeake Bay. So here's a little bit more information about those various tributary scale uh, pieces I talked about yesterday. Um, these, as you can see in, in Maryland, we've actually completed three of these. Um, in Virginia, we're about the same. And then uh, fortunately in Virginia as well, we have kind of a sixth tributary, what we sometimes refer to as the bonus tributary. Uh, that's the eastern branch of the Elizabeth River. You can see on the, on the very far right there, uh, that was a, another tributary that uh, the right amount of resources came into play to be able to restore that tributary. So we a lot of times refer to that as the bonus tributary when it comes to our tributary scale restoration efforts in Chesapeake Bay. So moving on to maybe the most iconic species here in Chesapeake Bay, uh, the blue crabs. Uh, as I think most people heard, uh, uh, during last year, uh, the decline in our blue crab population was, was well documented. Um, the way that we actually estimate the number of blue crabs in Chesapeake Bay each year is through what we call the Winter Dredge Survey. And that's a great cooperative program that's run by Maryland and Virginia together. And uh, they are actually finishing up right now, I think it's the 1st of March. But basically, they sample the population of blue crabs um, throughout the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries at about 1,500 sites per year. And uh, that gives us a, a, an incredible amount of data on how many blue crabs are out there, how many of, of the different sexes are out there, where within the bay um, they, they're found, um, also what type of overwintering mortality we sometimes have during colder winters that we've had this year. But it's, um, it really is a great data source and allows us to make really specific management changes on a year-to-year -year basis um, in the population. So this slide is one of the, the data sets that we get from that. And um, obviously with this decline, it's one of the reasons that the score fell uh, five points in this current version of the report. Um, but this slide uh, tells you where we are kind of based over the last 30 years that we have been doing the winter dredge survey. And it shows you that things are, are still better than they were back in the, the mid nineties through about uh, 2008 or so. 2008 was somewhat of a watershed year when both Maryland and Virginia for the first time really got together and worked on a baywide management plan that was focused primarily on protecting the female segment of the population. And you can see from the purple hash line there, that was our average during that period of time, to our yellow hash line there, that uh, that has overall borne us some success. Uh, blue crabs, I always tell people, are very confounding. <laughs> When it comes to managing them, we think we're going in one direction and, and then the population tells us something else. And so one of the things with this low number that was identified this past year that the states along with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration have decided is we're gonna do, do a new stock assessment of the blue crab population. Uh, both Maryland and Virginia are providing resources that through their general assembly sessions this year. NOAA has also provided some funds as well. And we actually kicked this process off last fall to look at the overall population of blue crabs throughout Chesapeake Bay and decide, you know, are our management triggers, uh, which are here on this slide, uh, the, the red area being the threshold that we don't want below, the green area there, the target that we would like to, to bounce around. Are those the right numbers for our blue crab population in Chesapeake Bay today? Uh, moving forward, you know, improving water quality, improving that underwater grass habitat is one it's still one of the most important things we can do to help ensure a healthy blue crab population, because that's where a lot of those small crabs uh, hide and forage as they come back into the bay. It's also where a large number of those crabs are spawned throughout the summertime as well. So the last species in our group are our shad. And a lot of people forget the fact that uh, shad, American shad, were actually the largest fishery 
that we had in Chesapeake Bay at one time. Uh, in many ways, uh, some people have actually referred to shad as the founding fish due to its importance um, throughout the Chesapeake Bay region uh, at one time. So uh, shad are a, a anadromous fish species. So that basically means that they are, are born in freshwater. They live most of their life out in uh, the ocean and they come back in to spawn much like salmon, also like striped bass as well. But um, shad, unfortunately, is not a species that we've had great restoration success with. Uh, we just got a new uh, stock assessment for American shad and river heron because they monitor those together in a lot of ways. And you can see that really since the mid 90s, we've been at this unfortunate low abundance of American shad throughout the Chesapeake Bay region. And we have several ideas for that. One is obviously because of the fact that we built many dams um, throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed and those dams uh, kept those fish from returning to their native spawning habitats. Also things like buffers that Beth mentioned earlier, um, having water quality that wasn't sufficient to um, have good spawning habitat in the rivers and streams where these fish want to spawn is, is another issue. And one uh, issue that has emerged uh, more recently with these fish is the uh, introduction back in the 70s of a non-native species called the catfish. Um, that is probably uh, preying upon a lot of these shad, especially when they're young, uh, before they head out to the ocean, and therefore not allowing those fish to reach maturity before they're, they're preyed upon by that invasive species. So um, something that we're continuing to work on in a number of different areas as well, in addition to improving water quality and habitat for the species as well. So I'm going to send it back to Beth. I think you're sending it back to me, Chris. No, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, a huge thanks to Chris and Beth for sharing all their thoughts and reflections on, on what's uh, behind the numbers. And I think, as you'll see, the state of the Bay um, is in an improving situation, but we are um, never satisfied with a 32 and we'll be continuing to work hard. And we know that if we follow the science, redouble our efforts, um, and hold everybody accountable, we can continue to make progress uh, for the Chesapeake Bay. And we've got great tools in the Clean Water Blueprint, new leaders coming online in the states, as well as other um, key agencies. And we're really excited about working with all of them, um, to, especially around accountability for clean water, healthy communities. Um, so, um, just before we wrap up and, and look at the questions, there are a lot of uh, a lot of questions, uh, great questions. I just want to thank all of you for being part of CBF. Um, we really couldn't do our work without you. And um, a huge thanks to everybody who is on today and all of your contributions uh, to a clean and healthy bay. Um, and with that, I will see if we have uh, any questions. Thanks, Hillary. We have a bunch of questions that have come through in the Q&A. Give me one second. I'm going to open it back up so we can see all of our speakers as we go through these questions. And uh, for folks who have entered questions into the Q&A, thank you so much for participating. Just so you know, if we don't get to your question, we will be following up after the webinar. So please um, don't worry about that. And I've tried to group them a little bit by topic. So we'll see where we end up here as we uh, roll through. Um, so to start, we have a couple of policy related questions. Uh, Stuart asked if there are any bills from the 2023 Virginia General Assembly uh, that have Bay impact, either good or bad. And I'd love to open that up a little bit more broadly and address maybe each of the states and what and what we're seeing um, in Maryland as well, if possible. But uh, Chris, would you want to start us off there on the Virginia side? Sure, uh, be glad to do that. And uh... There's by no means a lack of bills that affect uh, the Bay uh, in Virginia this year as we kind of wrap up our session. And I'll actually start first with the budget bill, because in a lot of ways, that's the one that most affects the Bay. And there's some really, really good news in there. Um, as it currently stands, about 100 and almost 40 million uh, for our Virginia Agricultural Call Share Program. And that's basically that, that program that helps put those best management practices on the ground to reduce pollution from agriculture. And as, as Beth and Hillary both mentioned, how important it was to um, continue those programs. 
Uh, we also have money in the budget to continue to upgrade wastewater treatment plants in Virginia. Um, the uh, upgrades that the state has made already, the General Assembly has invested in, um, have been one of the things that have really moved the needle on Bay Restoration. And um, we've gotten some of our largest gains when it comes to restoration um, of Bay water quality uh, because of those uh, type of efforts. Uh, a couple other things, uh, one that we're most excited about um, is we have a, a bill that will to put some incentives out there to help oyster shell recycling in Virginia. Um, we don't want to see any oyster shells go to landfills because they're such a valuable resource. And so uh, this is a, a bill that's probably going to end up setting up a grant fund to allow those programs to continue. And then another one that I'll mention from our, uh, from my section of the report is there's also a budget, uh, some, some budget increases and also some bill language that will help us catch more blue catfish in the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries and process those so that we can reduce their impact on those native species like blue crabs. Great, thank you, Chris, for running through Virginia there. Um, Chris is located down in Virginia. We don't have anybody on actually, apologies from our uh, Maryland or Pennsylvania policy team. Emily, so. I can just speak to the fact that Maryland uh, legislative sessions a little further behind than um, where Virginia is. Uh, the priority legislation, we're working on oysters, um, we're looking at uh, forests and living shorelines. So those are really important filters. Um, but uh, Maryland's a little bit further behind uh, than Virginia right now. Awesome, thank you, Hillary. Um, okay, perfect, so moving right along, we have a question from Lynn uh, asking the states are behind on the blueprint and who will take them to task? Great question, Lynn. Um, something that DBF has um, prided itself on accountability for many years. And right now the state that it is the furthest behind um, is Pennsylvania. And so we have joined several other states um, to sue uh, the Environmental Protection Agency since it is their role to hold Pennsylvania accountable for being behind. Um, and we are in and wrapping up um, a settlement agreement um, and hope to be able to share more very soon. But we believe that um, accountability across the board has been lacking and, and um, there, each of the states plays a, a critically important role in pollution reductions, and we need to continue uh, to hold each of the states accountable, but especially the states that are furthest behind. Great, thank you, Hillary. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, we do have several questions related to all of the different indicators that Beth and Chris talked us through. Um, and so I wanted to go a little bit in order here. We'll chat through buffers first. So Beth, uh, you're, you're on deck for a minute here. Um, so Theodore asked, how can we achieve a B for forest buffers when we have less than 25% of the target achieved? Yeah, that's a good question. So our initial score for forest buffers that was set back in 1998 reflected an uh, estimate of how many how much of the streams throughout the watershed were actually buffered at that time. So we're not actually basing our score on what the states committed to, we're basing our score on an estimate of, of how many buffers existed and whether we're losing them or not, if that makes sense. And, and I'll go to the, I think it relates also to, I see a question from Carol um, about the buffers and it, it does reflect buffers watershed wide. Uh, the data that we have are based on what, this, what the states report that they've implemented um, to the Environmental Protection Agency, our 10 million tree campaign would be, those trees would be counted. But I will tell you that there's a little bit, there's at least a year lag time in the data that we have. Um, so all of our efforts through the 10 million tree campaign probably haven't shown up yet just because there's a little bit of lag between when trees are planted and ultimately they get reported to the, the data that we're looking at. Great, thanks Beth. Um, another question about uh, buffers. John had John wanted to know um, since removing invasive vines that kill mature trees seems critical. Uh, is there work being done on this, or resources applied to it? Yeah, that's a really good question. And we we I mentioned the program that the the federal program called Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. It's been around since the mid two thousands. 
we got a lot of buffers in place then, but we didn't really have a great handle on how to control invasives at that time. So a lot of the early actors ended up with a lot of invasive plants. So one of the um, changes that we actually worked on through the last farm bill, which is where this program resides, was to pay farmers adequate amounts for controlling invasives because right now what they're offered through that program doesn't cover their costs and so we recognize this is a big issue both for our historic buffers as well as new ones that we want to plant that we need to really maintain them for at least three years to to get them growing and control invasives so yeah that's definitely on the radar and we're, we're working to make sure that there's enough resources for um, for agricultural producers in particular to cover the cost of maintaining and, and controlling invasive plants. Great, thanks Beth. Um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit down uh, into grasses for a second. Um, so Tori was asking for a little bit more information on underwater grasses and their role in carbon capture. Hillary, you wanna take that one or you want me to take first stab? Uh, you can take first stab. Or, or Chris for that matter. I'll, I'll say it and then you guys hop in. Um, sure. Sure. We're, we're aware of, of that um, as an option. In fact, one of our staff actually worked on the method that you could use to quantify the carbon benefits that would come from these blue carbon uh, kind of projects, which include underwater grasses and wetlands. Um, we haven't, to my knowledge, seen any, we've seen a lot of interest, I think, in, in this space, but I don't know that we've seen any implementation. And personally, I'm a a little concerned with underwater grasses in particular just because they can be so ephemeral you know they will pop up one year and then the next year they're gone and how does that relate to um to the role in carbon capture but um but we're, we're aware of the conversation uh nothing tangible to show yet in the bay region uh with that i'll chris or hillary i don't know if you want to sure add i'll just to add that. that you know we're really interested in carbon capture general you know generally across all of the work that we do and know for instance with uh, planting 10 million trees, um, that's going to have a benefit in carbon capture. Uh, many of the agricultural practices that um, we have been championing for clean water also have a, a benefit in terms of carbon capture. So certainly um, a great opportunity to do have multiple benefits. Yeah, and the only thing I'll add is, is as Beth said, this conversation is happening in a lot of different ways. We actually have had some legislation passed in Virginia in previous sessions that would set up a program that would allow the staff, to, if we can get um, the crediting scenarios right, and to best point, making sure that the ephemeral nature of grasses is, is more sustainable and we see these over a long period of time. Great, thank you all. Um, Chris, I wanted to look at blue crabs a little bit. Um, just broadly, oh, sorry here, I'm scrolling through. Uh, just broadly, so, you know, could you speak a little bit more to why the, the blue crab score went down so much and what tools do we really think could could help to address that? Sure, so the, the, the reason the score went down uh, by the, the number it did this year is, is the fact that, um, we had the lowest number of blue crabs on record this past year recorded by the winter drift survey. And again, we, we think that's a very good, very strong scientific survey. And so we use that as one of the guides in terms of making sure that um, um, we have a state of the base score line up with scientific data that's actually out there. Um, when it comes to restoring blue crabs, I think there's lots of things we can do. And it's making sure that all of those also line up with what happens out in the in the bay as a whole. Um, most people don't realize this, but one of the biggest drivers of blue crabs coming into the bay each fall actually can be hurricanes, tropical storm type events that blow larvae back into the Chesapeake Bay each fall when they come up the coast. So, but things like restoring water clarity so we have more grasses um, is really important. Um, another thing is reducing the number of predators like blue catfish out there is, is another thing we want to do. Um, also making sure that we don't harvest too many of the, of the blue crabs early in the year before they have a chance to spawn. Um, that's another thing that a number of folks are working on, uh, making sure that our fishery is right size for the population that's out there. Um, so there are a lot of things that people are looking at, and I think you'll see more ideas come to fruition after we do this next stock assessment, as that will update the scientific knowledge about the population. 
Thanks, Chris. And we're getting a little bit um, of notification in the chat. I think you're coming through a little bit unclear on your mic. If you'd be able to maybe move a little bit closer. Uh, I'll change things up a little bit. Hopefully that'll be. <laughs> sure, thanks for that. Um, so let me just see here. We've got a question on oysters. Uh, so what score for oysters would get us to a C? You know, do we have that? Or what needs to happen to, to move that to a C? Emily, was that question for me? Sorry, I was changing Sorry. my mind. Sorry, no, go ahead. You're good. Your mic sounds great. Yeah, the question was um, about oysters from Kathy. What score for what score for oysters would get us to a C? Yeah, so, yeah. so I, I, I think the thing is we want to continue to see investment in that tributary scale type restoration in order to, to move us forward. Um, you know, we're still at, at really a fraction of the overall population of oysters that we would have had historically in Chesapeake Bay. So um, continuing those tributary scale restoration efforts that have shown to be successful, um, I think is really important. Hopefully, uh, as we move past these first 10 or 11, if you look at it, when it comes to the bonus trip, we'll be looking at more uh, more and other trips to work at. I also think looking at oyster restoration at more of a landscape in terms of making sure not only we do the restoration in the water uh, for oysters, but also trying to restore some of those buffers on the land, trying to make sure um, we do some other practices to ensure that we have um, a watershed that supports healthy water quality and an increased long-term growth of oysters as well. It's gonna be really important to get us there. Awesome. Chris, I've got one more question for you on the indicators uh, at the moment. <laughs> Sorry to monopolize. Uh, Bill wanted to know, how have changes in forage fish populations like Menhaden impacted the overall state of fisheries in the Bay? Sure. So that's uh, Menhaden policy has been one of the things that from a fisheries perspective, CBF has spent a lot of time on over the last 25 years or so. And something we continue to be really concerned about. And actually uh, another positive that came out of the Virginia General Assembly session this year is that we have a bill headed to the governor to set up uh, hopefully a new set of studies um, led by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science that we can um, implement to better understand the population of forage fish like Menhaden and Chesapeake Bay. Um, our concern continues to be the fact that um, we have a very large fishery that operates um, primarily in the Virginia portion of the Chesapeake Bay or very near the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay in ocean waters. And do we have sufficient forage base um, of Menhaden and other forage to support species like striped bass? And that's why we continue to, to push to make sure we have the science to make those decisions um, you know, in a conservative manner. Um, there's also questions about um, ospreys. There's questions about the forage ability for marine mammals like whales and dolphins. And forage really is at this, at this time something that's so important to the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and something that we really need to get a better grasp on. And that's why we continue to push for policies at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission for a healthy menhaden population. And we continue to push for legislation like we did this past session to help better uh, understand that and invest the necessary resources to understand that population. Great, thanks, Chris. Switching gears over to land use and agriculture a little bit. Um, so we have an anonymous question that came in by asking about how do we reduce developed land along the bay to increase farm and tree buffer area? Or if already developed, how does changing policies um, either you know, shift to land use that is more bay friendly? Yeah, I guess I'll take, so when we're talking about development and loss of forest land and farmland to development, we're talking watershed wide. We're not just talking right along the bay. It's it's across the watershed where we're seeing these losses. And um, no, we're not gonna likely see development converted back to, to farmland or forests. But I guess the, the point is we can do a better use of our land use policies to, and I think Maryland, at least historically was a leader in this where we, you, you're thoughtful about development. You try to cluster, urban areas and you protect areas outside those urban areas and have a lower density. So I think there's a lot of land use policy that we can implement that would try to change this. We're always gonna have development, but how you develop and where you develop is really the key um, so that you're not sort of gobbling up these 
uh, areas, especially forests, um, that we would like to keep in forest. So I hope that answered the question. Thanks, Beth. One other ag-related question. Um, how are Lancaster or plain sect farmers uh, involved in bay restoration? Shifting to the PA, PA lens a little bit here. So Pennsylvania actually on the books has some fairly um, aggressive policies around agriculture, um, around manure management, around soil and or sediment and uh, runoff control, erosion control. Uh, the problem is they're um, not largely being implemented or enforced. And so a, a large part of Pennsylvania's plan to get on track for the blueprint is to inspect farms. Many of them are, as you, you noted, plain sect Amish and Mennonite farmers. Um, to inspect the farms, make sure they have the plans they need, make sure they're implementing the plans. And that's where, you know, cost share money comes in. Pennsylvania had a big win at the state level last year when they passed for the first time a state agricultural cost share program. Uh, we've been working hard at the federal level to bring more um, agricultural conservation dollars to the region. So clearly um, Amish farmers are, are part of that mix. Um, and the challenge in Pennsylvania is that there are a lot of small farms, whether they're Amish or, or um, or plain um, folks like us who are farming. So lots of farms, but uh, but again, it's not a lack of, in this case, not a lack of regulations. This is a lack of enforcement and, and implementation and, and funding is gonna be key to that. Thanks, Beth. All right, I think we have time for, we'll do one more question here. Hillary, this one's gonna be for you from Clay. What are the top influencing factors to the health of the Bay and what are the most impactful methods to influence those factors? What's CBF doing uh, to weigh in there? And what are the best ways for CBF supporters to contribute? Kind of a lot thrown into one question, but- uh, It's a great question, uh, an important one. And you know, over the last 40 years in uh, cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay, we've seen significant reduction in pollution from wastewater. It's been a crowning achievement um, for the Chesapeake Bay watershed and has really made a lot of the goals that we have reached possible. Um, but what that's left is um, a lot of pollution from agriculture and, and pollution running off um, cities and towns. And so the defining challenge of, our, of the Chesapeake Bay cleanup is um, addressing pollution running off of farms, towns, and cities. And uh, we think that focusing on agriculture and pollution from farms is um, a key factor in a healthy Chesapeake Bay, and we're doing that in a lot of different ways. Um, first one, I mentioned litigation and looking at uh, making sure we're holding states accountable, um, in this case, Pennsylvania accountable for um, pollution um, running off of farms. So we're also um, at this in the same right looking at the policies in each state. Um, we know that uh, scientific technical support to farmers and producers is critically important um, and making sure that those resources are available on farms to reduce pollution um, is, is going to have a really big impact. Um, there are a, a number of ways that, that you can do that um, and, and support CBF and its efforts. Um, that's everything from advocacy to um, contributing to the work that we do with uh, producers. And Beth is part of and leads the um, ag, ag team at CBF, who just is incredibly uh, incredible and working day to day on the ground with farmers um, to make sure that um, they that farmers have all the support they need um, in order to uh, reduce pollution off of their farms. And I think, Emily, is that it? We said that was the last question. That's right. I know we didn't quite get to everybody. Uh, like I said, we'll make sure that we follow up with any that we missed, or if anybody has questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And Hillary, I'll hand it back over to you. Great, thanks. So as Emily said, for those of you who whose questions we didn't get to answer, we will follow up. Thank you all so much for joining us today to learn more about the State of the Bay report. Um, and again, a huge thanks to Chris and Beth for their insights. Um, we couldn't do our work without all of you. So great appreciation from the entire CBF team, and I hope you have a great day.